Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jim Frame. I'm your EMS Medical Director. I've started the, the recording now. It's 20 hundred hours. And we're going to continue in a series. This is lecture number two of the Taxidrome series. Uh, you'll be uh, pleased to know that within this lecture, there will be between four and six questions, depending on how the mood of the National Registry is uh, for a particular testing cycle. But there's usually four to six questions that come out of what we're going to just be talking about today upwards of 10 to 15 for the entire four lecture series or five lectures, depending on how long we want to do this. In any event, uh, today they, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the uh, more common inhalation injuries that you can sustain with uh, uh, either the environment or with chemicals, hazardous materials, and such like that. First thing I want to do is at least uh, lay down some ground rules. Go ahead, type your questions in, uh, raise your hand when you do that. There's a little th thing up there that says that you can raise your hand um, and ask the question. And the next time that I look down at the questions, I can certainly answer it. And it doesn't matter if it, if it comes late from another topic that we've moved on to or not. Don't worry about that at all. It's sometimes good to just kind of backtrack a little bit. Just to review a couple of things also, when we talk about poisonings of any type, poisoning is a substance that exists in nature that will do harm to you in minute or, or regular quantities. Substance abuse, particularly overdoses, are usually medications, but sometimes uh, derivations of medications where if they're taking the proper dose, they're not going to hurt you. It's when you do overdoses or combine them with other medications that you're not supposed to. This is then con uh, considered to be a overdose or a substance abuse kind of problem. Poisonings, the difference between them and poisonings is that a poisoning is a naturally occurring substance or a chemical that actually does harm even in minute doses. So just be aware of the difference between the two. Don't forget your OPQRST and your sample histories. Don't forget that there's four ways to get this, ingested, injected, absorbed, or inhaled, and um, when to induce vomiting, when to just give charcoal, when to leave well enough alone, and uh, when to get, uh, get hustled to the hospital. Now, one of the questions it has to do with self-preservation. And this question looked like it was on the last five versions. And it's about scene safety. And everything has to do about your situational awareness to make sure that you're looking out for yourself. So the first consideration, any poisoning, any substance abuse, any kind of scene that you walk up on is, where is your personal threat? Sometimes it's obvious you've got a guy standing out there with a gun or a machete. At other times, it can be innocuous as three or four people laying on the ground uh, around a car and finding out that there was something inside the car that was burning that produced a toxic gas and they, of course killed them all or at least maimed them. Um, when you pull up on any scene, if you see multiple people lying around, first thing you have to think about is, is there something in the air or something everybody's been in contact with that all of a sudden made them fall? So just situational awareness, read the questions carefully. A lot of times they give away the answer right in the question about saying, you know, what is your first priority in any scene? You know, it's, of course, read the questions carefully. One of those answers is going to be me. I care about me. I'm my favorite person. And so I'm not going to let my favorite person die because I rushed into a scene, eyes wide shut. Okay, be cognizant of your situation situational awareness essay and make sure that when you see these questions you're answering stabilization of the scene using protective gear and situational awareness in other words safe for you to enter the scene okay we have other uh, uh, considerations that we had discussed the last time one was alcohol uh, don't forget your alcohol your alcohol withdrawal syndromes know the four stages of alcohol. Uh, you're going to go through a uh, nausea and vomiting stage once you try to withdraw from the alcohol. And then the second, you're going to go into maybe some tremors and such. Third is going to be seizures and fourth, you're going to start hallucinating. It's in that fourth stage, the delirium tremens stage, uh, that we see mortalities as high as 30 to 50 percent. Like half your people are going to die. And so it's a with these folks, it's just a matter in the pre-hospital setting to load them up with as much Ativan, Valium, Versed, or whatever you have from a benzodiazepine standpoint to get them calmed down as fast as you can, as much as you can, 
and be prepared to deal with any apnea or respiratory depression that occurs afterwards. Your paramedics, you get the tube, you get to put on CPAP and BiPAP, you get to do these things. And so it should give you some circle of comfort to know that any complication that comes about as a result of too much Advien, too much Versa, too much Valium, that you can handle it. All you do is tube them and they're out of danger. And I think any medical director, at least any board certified emergency medicine director with EMS experience who knows what you guys and gals go through in the field will be able to accept the fact that sometimes you'll slip a little bit too far because patients can be very sensitive to medications. I can give some of you guys 10 milligrams of Valium and you'll still be reading a book to me. I can give some people five milligrams of Valium and they're out cold and I gotta recover them for 30 minutes. It, it really depends on, on just the person themselves. So when it comes to withdrawal syndromes, we're watching for the big ones, alcohol withdrawal, cocaine withdrawal, and amphetamine, met amphetamine withdrawal. Uh, those are the big ones. Alcohol being, of course, the, the scariest of all of them. Um, okay, let's uh, move on to tonight's topics. Let me just spin up here a little bit. I wanted to start out the conversation this evening with uh, some comments about the gases. Inhalation injuries represent a huge part of it, and almost 30% of the deaths that occur out there are from inhalation. If you remember, there was a terrorist attack on a Russian theater some years back, and the Russians in their uh, uh, attempts to be brutal be brutal about these things. In 1998, Dave and Linda Sucker. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, we got everybody muted. Um, in the brutal way that they sometimes approach these things, they went and flooded the atmosphere within the theater that were being held hostages with a narcotic. She said, if you want to be successful in this business, you know, you got to sell it. They fell for each other hard and fast. Their shared love of music, the outdoors, and little Jordan. He loves Jordan very much. I know when I met him, he definitely had you know, parenting time with her. And it would go back and forth between. Juan, can you please mute your microphone? Mary also had a daughter from another relationship. And in June 2000, she and Dave took the big step of blending their families. I had my daughters by my side. He had his two good buddies, and we took our vows and celebrated with everybody around us. Linda also seemed to find happiness in a new relationship. His name was Carl. Hey, Dr. Frame, I'm sorry. I think that's Juan or Sarah. A couple of you guys do not have your microphones muted. Please mute your microphones. It won't allow me to do it for you. You know, I've met him a handful of times, but more than. It may allow you to mute the mic. Ah, that's much right. better. I think we're there. All right. Uh, yeah, be cognizant of your microphones, folks. That uh, uh, there's, These are very sensitive. And of course, this Zoom program, which is probably the best that I've, thing that I've ever seen, picks up in every little noise. So anyway, let's uh, sc scroll up to my inhaled... Uh, uh, substances that can cause problems. Poisonings, uh, of course, can be by any of the four ways, but the, the biggest one being inhalation. That's going to be the most immediate. And so we'll start with carbon monoxide since it's the first one that popped up for me. Carbon monoxide, col colorless, odorless, tasteless, displaces oxygen, preventing oxygen to the tissues. Now, this is a very important concept because we're going to be discussing the cyanide and they're going to be discussing carbon monoxide. So I'm going to be using these two to compare each other. Carbon monoxide <clears throat> has to be in a concentration that will displace oxygen in the air. If you fill up an enclosed room with so much carbon monoxide that you have no choice but to breathe oxygen, I'm sorry, breathe carbon monoxide in the atmosphere, what you're doing is displacing oxygen. For some of you firefighters that are out there, if you walk into a computer room after the fire extinguishing system went off with Halon, Halon works by taking all the oxygen out of the air, displacing all the oxygen, 
and therefore the fire goes out. If you remember the fire triangle, the fire tetrahedron, whatever you're studying these days, you'll see that oxygen or air is one of the sides of the triangle or the tetrahedron. Once one side is removed, the fire goes out. Unfortunately, if you remove oxygen from a human being, that human being dies from anoxia. In other words, not enough oxygen. So when you fight fires, especially in high-tech computer rooms and such, halon will displace all the oxygen. This displacement of oxygen is very key because many substances can poison just by displacing oxygen. But there's a couple substances out there that actually interfere with oxygenation at the cellular level. Carbon monoxide is one of them, cyanide is the other one. When you look at the carbon monoxide molecule and you take a nice deep breath and inhale it, it's 250 times more likely to attach to hemoglobin than the oxygen molecule. The affinity, in other words, the liking of or the attraction to carbon monoxide by a hemoglobin, the little red blood cell, is 250 times greater for the carbon monoxide than is the oxygen. It's amazing. You can have 250, 249 oxygen molecules, one carbon monoxide molecule, and that hemoglobin will seek out the carbon monoxide. When it binds to carbon monoxide, that means that the oxygen cannot bind to the hemoglobin, and therefore at the cellular level, in other words, at the red blood cell level, you're not able to carry oxygen to the tissue. Subsequently, even though you know you're breathing in, your tissue doesn't know that you're breathing in oxygen, cannot utilize the carbon monoxide, and as a result, the tissue becomes anoxic. Well, name one of the biggest, best, brightest tissues in the body, the brain. That's going to be very sensitive to hypoxemia. And subsequently, within four to six minutes, the brain is dead. Shortly thereafter, the heart dies as a result of that, which is why it's a colorless, odorless, tasteless in many instances. But we all know that carbon monoxide, especially suicides, tend to be from running automobiles within an enclosed space, running generators or other types of power tools within an enclosed space. You displace oxygen and you're hemoglobin in your body has an attraction for carbon monoxide. Now, this is all the result of incomplete fuel, and so sometimes you can walk outside and say, boy, I smell smoke, carbon monoxide, and this is the problem that you have. Now, treatment. Obviously, scene safety, so I hate to hammer this home again, but it is one of the National Register questions, is you're going to make sure you're okay. So your protective gear, maybe an air mask or, or some other device that allows you to, to utilize a self-contained breathing apparatus, you'll be able to don that, get into the enclosed structure, open the doors and windows, start airing it out, locate the victim, pull them outside the fresh air. Those are the first big steps. But the first step is knowing you're seen, in other words, situational awareness, have the proper protective gear on, and making sure that you're going to be safe. You're not going to do anybody any good trying to rescue somebody if you drop. That's, that's just a basic fact. So once you get the patient outside, for carbon monoxide, you put the patient on 15 liters non-rebreather mask, and you run that for 90 minutes. Within 90 minutes, 80 to 90 minutes, all the carbon monoxide will be out of the bloodstream, and there won't be any evidence of carbon monoxide doing any damage to the tissues at this point. You're saturating the blood with so much oxygen that as the carbon monoxide is being offloaded into the lungs and the patient's breathing it out, oxygen is going to replace that and you're going to get your patient back to normal. The question becomes, how long were you exposed to that carbon monoxide and has it done any damage? And this is when you get into cognitive testing. In other words, testing a person's avail um, ability to think through a problem. And adaptive um, concerns that you have about a patient doing the proper thing in the morning, brushing their teeth, going to the bathroom, you know, taking showers and such like that. Um, and you want to do that in a proper sequence in a proper order. Carbon monoxide, if a person has been exposed to carbon monoxide for too long, even though you put the 90 minutes of oxygen mass on them, 15 liters non-rebreather, fill up the little reservoir bag, even though you've given the patient that, 
they may still have some brain damage as a result of it. So it's not over. Just putting oxygen on the patient, bring them to the hospital. I don't put 90 minutes on them and then decide, oh, hey, you're back to normal. And we know by our studies that all the carbon dioxide is gone. So I'm going to go ahead and send you home. That doesn't happen. That won't happen. What I do in the emergency department is something that uh, we, we want to measure the direct correlation of the carbon dioxide that's in the bloodstream still. And that's called the carboxyhemoglobin. And if the patient still has that uh, at a high enough level within the bloodstream, then we can anticipate that there's going to be some mental capacity issues later on in life. Therefore, when you get on the scene, you assess the scene for your own safety, prop down the proper gear, ventilate the space, locate the victim, move the victim out. All right, so that's carbon monoxide. So the big takeaways there are 15 liters non-rebreather for 90 minutes. Number two is it's 250 times more likely to bind to hemoglobin and therefore uh, displace it displace the oxygen off the hemoglobin uh, substance that delivers the oxygen to the tissue. And the third is that it's colorless, odorless, tasteless, and it functions by poisoning the body at the cellular level. In other words, it prevents oxygen from binding to the hemoglobin. In other words, the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. Um, when you get on the scene, you're going to see these patients. They're going to have that so-called cherry red color of the skin. Now, here's a trigger for you. Whenever you get on the scene and your patient appears cherry red, you're going to throw the pulse oximeter on them. And lo and behold, your pulse oximeter is going to read 100%, yet your patient's still acting anoxic. The cherry red color is because of the affinity of the carbon dioxide. It really lights up the hemoglobin. And subsequently, your, your whole body's going to look like it's flushed. When you see the word cherry on an exam, which has to do with inhalation poisons, Cherry is only assigned to one gas, carbon monoxide. When you see that in a question, be looking for carbon monoxide. It's the only poison that's really out there that can produce a cherry red skin color that you commonly run into in everyday life. These patients are also going to be a little tachycardic. They're going to be contracting real hard, trying to move oxygen or hemoglobin around the body, thinking that it's bound oxygen when it has and it's bound carbon monoxide. And of course, you're going to get bounding pulses with it as well. Later on, late in the carbon monoxide poison, of course, it comes your traditional signs and symptoms of cyanosis and such like that. So again, remove the patient from the environment or air out the place, oxygen, and you're good to go. Any questions on carbon monoxide? All right. The second gas that you're going to run into commonly is going to be chlorine. Now, chlorine can be as a result of cleaning agents, bleaches, and such like that. The best, fastest way to release chlorine gas into the environment is go ahead and take bleach and mix it with ammonia. And you're going to get not only an ammonium chloride release, but you're going to get some pure chlorine gas. Here's the problem with chlorine. Chlorine, chlorine is, going to ha is very heavy. It has an atmosphere greater than one. Subsequently, when you get into densities of a gas and such, anything greater than one is going to sink. So you get the classic chlorine gas truck that's at the bottom of a hill in a tunnel under an overpass or under a bridge where you get a tank rupture. Again, situational awareness. You're going to be with your binoculars looking at the placard on the back of it, looking up the number, and as soon as you see chlorine gas, you're going to know this gas is settling down around the ground. This is very similar to the mustard gas they use in World War I when the uh, shell would go off, the mustard gas was released. And the soldiers would put on their mask and actually jump out of their foxholes and lie next to the foxhole because they knew that the mustard gas, just like chlorine gas, sinks to the lowest levels and they'll actually fill up a foxhole. You can actually walk past the foxhole filled with chlorine gas and the chlorine gas will be settled in there like a cloud, but yet you're standing on top of the foxhole to the side of it and you can see the cloud below you. 
That's how dense this stuff can be. Now, chlorine is a huge irritant to the lungs, and you should be able to smell and see this one coming a mile away. As soon as you take a breath, the burning is so intense, you feel like your whole body is going to lock up. That's the problem with chlorine gas. If you want to do an experiment, do it under supervision. Go ahead and, and do that ammonium bleach together, and, and you're going to see what kind of potent environment you're going, to, you're going to create. And it will be poisonous environment if it's in an enclosed space. So chlorine... Uh, mostly in cleaners, uh, obviously bleach, but also in industry, if you have every industry in your towns or fire protection districts or municipalities, wherever you're at, chlorine gas is going to be a part of some of their processes. It's used very heavily in industry. Now, so you get on the scene and you got this real sharp pain in your nose and burning sensation and your eyes, nose and throat start to burn and then your eyes start to water and you start coughing a little bit. You see a bunch of people lying around on the ground there. You know that they've been exposed. Some are going to be laying still. They're either in shock or they're already dead. Some of these patients are going to be seizing. And so your objective is not to rush in and grab the seizing patient and run out. You can't possibly hold your breath long enough to do that, first of all. Second is, as soon as this stuff comes in contact with your skin, it's going to burn like hell as well. Chlorine is one of those gases that can poison you in two ways, either through absorption, through inhalation. So be cognizant of it, especially uh, you guys that are going in with fire gear and such like that, but not full SCBA or hazmat level one suits, where your perspiration itself is going to react with the chlorine gas and actually drop you right there, either through absorption or through creating its own chlorine gas right into your nose and mouth. So this would be a, um, uh, quite a difficult assessment and management for you. All you can do for them is high concentration humidified oxygen and then rinse off their skin if it's really come in contact with them. So I'd peel back some clothing, a booster liner, or some sal normal saline in bottles or whatever you got there. And you're going to wash this stuff off their body. Flushing solves just about everything. And so getting the chlorine that's attached to your skin off of them is going to be the most important thing. Now, chlorine is just one of those things that displaces oxygen. And it's not going to be able to uh, work at the cellular level except to say that it's going to block oxygen from getting into the red blood cells and such. Chlorine in high concentrations, of course, can cause a lot of ventricular dysrhythmias. What's the takeaway point of chlorine gas? You're on the scene. You look at a placard. You see that the, you are upwind, the truck is down the hill. What's your major concerns? What gas are you looking for? And invariably, the answer is going to be chlorine gas. This is a favorite. It doesn't take long. Um, when you look at chlorine from a standpoint of displacing oxygen, I should have mentioned this as well. If you take a couple of breaths, the chlorine is going to get into the bloodstream. And again, it's going to... It's going to block certain enzymes, the oxidase enzymes, the cytochrome oxidase enzymes. You can look that up if you want to get fancy and read the actual enzyme. But the bottom line is that it's going to block utilization of the oxygen as well. So not only is it burning up your lung tissue, causing blistering with your lung tissue, not only being absorbed through the skin, but once it gets into the bloodstream, if it hasn't killed you yet from a lack of oxygen, then it's going to kill you by... Uh, disrupting the cellular level utilization of oxygen. So this is the second gas that disrupts cellular level and poisons you at a very specific level. In this particular case, oxygen, same carbon dioxide. In. The third one that we're going to talk about is going to be the cyanide. Now cyanide is um, it's probably the fastest acting inhalation substance. I mean, it only takes one or two breaths and and you're pretty much unconscious. A couple more breaths after that, you've stopped the heart. Again, a cytochrome oxidase inhibitor. In other words, it inhibits certain enzymes within the uh, oxygen phosphorylation pathway. In other words, the pathway that utilizes oxygen. So when you think about cyanide, you think about the old execution chambers in California where they would do um, a lethal gas. You're put into a closed atmosphere, and then they drop the, hydro the uh, cyanide uh, mothballs, if you would, into hydrochloric acid. And of course, the producing cyanide gas would uh, judicially execute the prisoner. Uh, 
it works very quickly. One or two breaths, like I said, and it's done. What it does is it physically blocks any oxygen from going into the cell and for that cell to utilize the oxygen. So once again, in addition to chlorine and carbon monoxide, you got another substance here that blocks oxidation. In other words, the body's ability to use oxygen at the cellular level. Now, although we think about cyanide as burning silk, synthetic carpets, plastics, and such like that in house fires, you also have to think about it in a powder form as well. Cyanide, when it's used in industry, for instance, nickel plating or such like that that you may have in your town, is through some very sophisticated industrial complexes, the home materials that you have, or even at the fire station or in the ambulance services that you're running with, are going to have some cyanide in them. It's part of the industrial process to make them shiny and, and clear. Nickel has to attach to steel, and you do that through cyanide uh, scratching and such like that. I mean, it's all very sophisticated. Cyanide will come in a powder form. So you can put your hand into a powder of cyanide as long as you don't have perspiration on your arm. And you'll be able to pull your hand out, brush off your the, all the powder, and then, and then go ahead and flush copiously. But yet, once that turns into a gas, or once that cyanide is absorbed into the bloodstream, it takes 15 seconds to a minute, maybe two minutes to, to kill you. It's very lethal. It's considered the most lethal uh, poisonous gas that's out in the, in the world today. And cyanide, of course, has uh, historical significance as well back in uh, World War II and a lot of spy uh, Cold War type stuff. Cyanide capsules were carried by uh, people who could be captured one bite and that was the end of it or it was a needle inside of a coin or a needle inside of a capsule. You stuck yourself cyanide and that was the end and you could commit uh, suicide in that manner. So lots of ways to die, a million ways to die in the West. This was one of them was cyanide. So again, real, real fast, the, what you'll hear now on the test, and here's another exam clue. Uh, just like you saw with the cherry color skin with carbon monoxide, you're gonna see another classic here, and this is gonna be using your sense of smell. Now, I don't have a habit of getting on hazmat scenes and seeing smoke and such like that going into it and sniffing it. So, oh boy, it smells like rotten eggs. It smells like sulfur. It smells like almonds. It smells like this stuff. Uh, chances are that'll be the last assessment that I ever make in life. So, if you happen to be on a scene and all of a sudden something smells different, then you have to be thinking about peculiar gases. What you'll see on your test exam, on your, I'm sorry, test questions on your national registry exam is you're gonna be given a problem that says that you can smell the odor of almonds on the breath of the patient. That's gonna be your big clue when you see the word almonds, it's cyanide. If you see the word, word cherry red skin, it's carbon monoxide. Almonds are going to give it away. That's going to be cyanide. Burning byproducts of household furniture when you get on house fires and such. Car seats inside automobiles. The plastic dashboards that they now use, even the hard plastic stuff. Electrical wires and the rubber that burns off of them can sometimes produce cyanide. Cyanide can be produced in a lot of different ways these days, which is why OSHA, as well as NFPA, mandate that if you go into an enclosed structure, whether it's a structure, fire, building, fire, whatever it is, even a car fire, that you have to have masks on because of this incidence of cyanide and how it's crept into society, being a synthetic or a, or a vinyl or you know, whatever it is that's burning, cyanide gas is produced. So be leery of it. And then again, just like every other gas that we're gonna talk about, 15 liters non-rebreather on the face. Now, the difference between cyanide poisoning and carbon monoxide poisoning, carbon monoxide doesn't allow the oxygen to bind to hemoglobin. Cyanide just gets down to the tissue level and says, I'm not going to let you utilize the oxygen down here, so you can unload all the oxygen you want. I'm going to uncouple you from the tissue, and it's game over. So it doesn't take long. 20, 40 seconds is the mean average but one, uh, anywhere from 15 seconds to one minute. 
uh, in an inhaled form. If you bite down on a poison capsule, it's instantaneous. If you stick yourself with a poison needle, it's instantaneous. Uh, so be be leery of cyanide. It's it's the it's the deadliest out there. Um, they when they talk about treatments for cyanide, I tend to just put non rebreathers on these people, and then I kind of watch them. If they've had any kind of significant exposure, then you have to come out with the so called cyanide antidote kit. And the objective is is turn is to bind all the cyanide that's in the body, and then convert it once again with a second material and then once it becomes inert then the kidneys just allow you to urinate it right out of the body so look at your antidote kit your cyanide kits from a standpoint of being able to first stage bind something second stage create a higher concentration of that hemoglobin and then third stage is to get it to convert once again then excrete it um, it by the time you open the kit, most people are dead from cyanide exposures. If your patient is still alive after a cyanide exposure, then the cyanide kits will probably be worthwhile. Quite frankly, many fire departments, unless they have hazmat teams, many fire departments have one kit in their ambulance. <laughs> They're confident they'll never use it. If they do use it, it's going to be on somebody who's survived the initial insult and could probably benefit from the kit. But I wouldn't get too worried about stocking this on the ambulance unless it's a local policy. Most cyanide you're going to run into are either going to require high supplemental oxygen or they're already going to be dead. All right. Any questions about those gases? Now, fourth gas that you can come up with is not odorless, colorless, or tasteless. It smells like rotten eggs. This is going to be hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide in a gas form can be very deadly. This displaces oxygen, but it deposits a sulfur molecule in there, which also um, stops oxygen from being utilized at the cellular level. This has a very strong, very pungent rotten egg odor to it. And as a matter of fact, as soon as you take a sniff of it, you throw up or you're getting ready to throw up. It hits, hits you that hard. And so the hydrogen cyanide uh, produced from sulfuric, sulfuric acid, like in certain toilet bowl cleaners, um, battery acids. The Some of the guys that are out there, if, if you've had cars around since the 70s and 80s, when we used to have to fill up uh, the water and the, and the batteries, now that they're all sealed and self-maintained, but back then we had to put in uh, distilled water into the batteries to uh, uh, keep the sulfuric acid going along. Once these batteries exploded, once these batteries spilled over, once you got that sulfuric acid on your hand, it burned like hell. And if you got a whiff of that gas, it would burn like hell when you took a breath. Or if it got in your eyes, it would water like all get up as well. Um, as you can imagine, a large battery or something that's burning in a confined space that gives off hydrogen sulfide is going to smell real, real bad. It's going to cause death, obviously, within 30 seconds to a minute. And that does it by not only oxygen displacement, but also interfering with the utilization of oxygen at the cellular level. So, um, you know, the, the, the toilet bowl cleaner was probably the most interesting one. That was the actual fire hearse story that I had in the 1970s where we mixed uh, some boy, toilet bowl cleaner in, scrubbed out the toilet, and somebody decided, hey, you know, let's keep it clean for the whole day. Let's put a little bleach in the toilet, and the bleach will keep the ceramic nice and clean. Well, it, it did. It kept it nice and clean for a whole day because nobody could use the toilet because nobody was in the fire station because everybody bailed out of the fire station because nobody could breathe. So, you know, there's a, there's a tail end to this story. He accomplished his mission. Nobody used the toilet. So you have to be careful of bleach mixing with anything. Toilet bowl cleaners, ammonia, probably the two worst things that you could do. Hydrogen sulfide in the case, however, of rotten eggs is gonna be your association on the test between words and what the answers are. Um, so I don't know that I have any other hydrogen sulfide stories there. All right, uh, anybody have any questions? I'm looking at the question uh, box here and I don't see anything. So either I've put you all asleep or we've been pretty thorough with this. Okay. 
So Brenda had a total PC crash now that the world all knows it. That's cool. Brenda, are you back on now? All right, Jonathan, good. Okay. All right, the next, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other um, gases that are out there that can cause a lot of damage, uh, that can be poisonous and such like that. In high enough concentration, anything is going to be poisonous if it displaces oxygen out of the atmosphere. And so uh, this is, you know, this is where you have to have a little bit of sanity about you when you're reading some of the hazmat books and such. They're going to say, yeah, this is toxic. How is it toxic? Is it toxic at the oxygen utilization level where one or two or three breaths and I'm done for, such as chlorine gas, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, or cyanide? Or is it going to be one of those things where it's going to displace oxygen and I'm actually functioning in a 9% or a 15% oxygen environment? I might be able to get one minute's worth of breathing before I collapse and die as well. So not to test any waters, but gases in their pure form very rarely exist in nature. And there's a good chance, that especially with combustion, burning house materials, burning truck materials, such like that. With any kind of combustion, you're going to get incomplete combustion and you're going to get multiple gases at the same time. Cyanide could very well be hidden in those. So again, the, uh, uh, the associations I went over, make sure that you know the associations of rotten eggs to sulfide, odor of almonds to cyanide, cherry red skin to carbon monoxide, and make sure that you're very clear that situational awareness and proper protective gear are the two mainstay answers you're going to get and it's going to nail at least half of the questions that you're going to have just in that short little blurb that i gave you all right we move on to caustics now caustics most of these are as a result of ingestion either accidentally or intentionally but they're also um, uh, can be a a gas producer as well. So let's take uh, Drano. It comes in crystal powder form and such like that. You pour it into a drain and they tell you to kind of close off the drain a little bit because of the presence of hydrogen sulfide or hydrofluoric acid or some of the other uh, nasty gases that are out there that can not only displace oxygen, but also interfere with the oxygen being used at the hemoglobin or the tissue level. So we see with certain caustics and suicide attempts, a person will take a cup of Drano or a person will reach down for their Gatorade bottle and accidentally put drain cleaner into their mouth and swallow it. These are very caustic. They have pHs that are somewhere around 10, 11, or 12, which is just incredibly caustic and tend to be alkalized in the worst of the worst, not only for eye contact, but as well as esophagus contact. And just with one swallow, you're going to get the worst pain that you've ever felt in your life. It'll burn the esophagus all the way down into easily a partial thickness burn where blisters will form within minutes in the esophagus in the mucosal lining. And then some of those will even break open and, and cause you even bigger problems with, you know, constant drainage of water down into the uh, stomach. Um, if it's inhaled, you can get both stomach, I'm sorry, esophageal burns as well as tracheal burns. And then you're going to get some burns inside the alveoli of the lungs, which then makes the lung totally useless at that point. So uh, bottom line is be careful of the caustics. Now, there's a gazillion caustics out there. I can't even remotely go through them except to say drain cleaner and such like that are the most notorious of these. And the objective here is if it gets on their skin and they're, po they're being poisoned from skin contact, you got to flush it with water. The almighty latest and greatest thing to dilute everything in the world with uh, is water. Uh, you use run up enough water past anything, it's going to wash away. Um, but if it's not on the skin, if it's been inhaled, then you displace the, uh, the chemical with 100% highly concentrated oxygen, 100% concentration at 15 liters and you make yourself a pretty decent clip to the hospital with these patients. More likely than not, most of these patients will get intubated and we use a gentle intubation on these folks. We'll get them to sleep, get the intubation 
completed, but we won't put any positive end excretory pressure on it because I don't need to be driving this stuff into the bloodstream. Um, we'll be using inverse ratios, in other words, prolonging the expiration time and making the inspiration time just short enough to flood the oxygen into the lungs and then taking a three or four cycles for the chest to completely retract and force out whatever's in the lung. And so it gets to be a, a, quite a challenge to make sure that you're not oxygenating the patient at the same time, getting the tidal volume back off of them so that you can start diluting out the gas. And with each breath, you lose half of what's in there. So you know, within six or seven cycles, you can get it down to negligible. Uh, this is on an iron rebreather, or if you like to intubate them, uh, so be it. Now, uh, for eye exposure, obviously, with caustics, they're going to tell you to flush the patient with 0.9 or more saline until you get them to the hospital. Uh, that's a continuous flush. It hurts like hell. You can start an IV and give them some fentanyl or some Dilaudid or morphine, whatever you're carrying, uh, to make sure that as you're flushing that the pain is at least somewhat subsided uh, when it comes to flushing those eyes. You're not going to see much on the test as far as swallowing caustics, although it might still be there. Uh, where you're going to come into contact with caustics on a national registry exam is going to be about the eyes because it's, it can coagulate the entire cornea. So when I get them in the emergency room, I take off all their dressings and I see where you flush the patient. I'm going to look at it and it's like looking down at two whites of an egg. I mean, it's wrinkling. It's completely opaque. You can't see anything, and the patient certainly cannot see out of them. So this is where we either do corneal transplants or we patch the eyes and then give it two to three to four days to start the healing process. So the faster you get to the patient with the caustic eye injury, the better their chances of retaining their eyesight. And it's going to just be a matter of taking the saline bottle, taking your knife or whatever you windshield punch you've got anything just poke a hole in it and just start with some gentle pressure gentle pressure of the bottle giving you a nice water stream to get it all washed out of your eye and that flush has to occur for between 20 and 30 minutes you can't just go through one bottle and say hey you've had enough it's not going to be enough because we're trying to neutralize the ph at the same time we're trying to flush all the substance out of the eye and it's going to be very, very important that you realize that it may take two, three, or four bottles to completely erase the entire substance out of the eyes. Caustics are just that. They're very, very alkaline, and they tend to penetrate into tissue further and deeper than acids do. If a person ever asks you on the street, hey, would you like to have hydrochloric acid thrown in your face, or would you like this really caustic drain cleaner substance thrown in your face, Hydrochloric acid has a really great reputation for having a pH of one and it burns through floors. But yet, when it comes to body tissue and such, the damage is much less with a high acid content than it is with a high base content. So just know acids are bad, but caustics and, and alkalis are much, much worse for the body. And when you see caustics such as this, associated with the eyes, it's gonna to have to be a copious flush for a long period of time. When we get them into the hospital, of course, as soon as you have done your three or four liters in the field and you've done your IV with your pain medications, I get the patient lying flat and then I throw some pH paper in their eye. And I'll be able to tell right away how successful we have been in getting all the caustic out of them. Sometimes it'll light up dark blue and that's a 12 and we still gotta keep flushing them until we get it all out. Or you'll get lucky and it lights up turquoise and you're sitting around seven and you can stop at that point. You'll still have to go with the pain medications, obviously. And don't forget the pain medication here. Just because they got something splashed in their eyes doesn't mean that it's not painful. Okay, if a person takes some of that drain cleaner, let's go back to the drain cleaner for a second. A case that I actually had uh, several years ago when Drano was a very popular suicide method. Patients would drink it, and then by the time they called 911, realizing that they really did a stupid thing, and we arrived on a scene, you usually had an esophagus that was completely dissolved in a stomach that had more holes in it than you could possibly count. 
as it dissolved its way through the stomach tissue. And then of course, when you dissolve the esophagus, the esophagus is being uh, fed by no less than 50 or 60 arteries or real small arteries, but nonetheless, when you open all of them up, they don't necessarily burn off. And so you're gonna get bleeding into the chest, what they call mediastinitis, a GI bleed at the same time. And a caustic ingestion of Drano is just about 100% fatal. I haven't seen any successes come out of those at all. And once they vomit and aspirate and that stuff gets into the lungs, uh, yeah, I don't see how you could possibly survive something like that with half your lung tissue dissolved almost instantaneously. So whenever you do get a patient like this, if the um, MSDS calls for a certain specific antidote to be given and they have it packaged right there, go ahead and give the antidote. <coughs> if you don't have an antidote, um, you cannot... You cannot give anything like epicac or something that will induce vomiting. You just can't do it. If the antidote's available, give the antidote, but don't give just anything. Well, you swallowed this caustic stuff, so let's, uh, you know, let's uh, let's give you this bottle of Maalox. So it'll neutralize it. We call it a day. You know, that's not appropriate. Okay, if there's a specific antidote, give it. If not, don't do anything. Don't give anything that's going to induce vomiting. Don't tube any tubes down there to pump out their stomachs. As soon as I drop that tube in the back of their throat, it's going to pierce right through the esophagus. And if I start suctioning, I'm going to get things like, oh, heart, lungs, great vessels, et cetera. Not stuff that you're very encouraged about seeing coming through a suction tube. Um, and you're not even going to give activated charcoal, to be honest with you. You have to keep these patients just perfectly still, anticipate their seizures, anticipate death. But one thing you can't do is you can't jostle these people around and you can't induce vomiting. You can't give anything. Once the esophagus is perforated, once the, the stomach is perforated, you got complete access to the lungs. As soon as I swallow something, it goes right into the lungs. Charcoal will induce a fatal episode as well. So you're between a rock and a hard place, which is why any significant drain cleaner ingestion, not just a mouthful, but a couple of gulps, is a suicide in 10. And these patients have other issues going on as well. It's a bad scene all the way around. All right. I think we can get past that. Let's go to methyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol is also known as wood alcohol. And as soon as you hear methyl alcohol and wood alcohol, what's the first thing you think about? Blindness. As soon as a person ingests this, the retina is shot. It's gone. They drink two or three cups. Tastes just like regular alcohol. You can mix it in a drink and drink it. You can drink it straight up and drink it. And it will cause blindness. And there's no hope recovery from that blindness. It, for some reason, has a great affinity for the retina, and it just burns up the retina. That's methyl alcohol. Now, um, here's the beauty of it. When you drink the alcohol, the methyl alcohol, the wood alcohol, it should have a skull and crossbones on it to indicate that it's a very bad poison. But once they drink it, they're going to go, yeah, you know, I'm doing perfectly fine. So they go home, they go to sleep, and they wake up blind the next morning. It's not an immediate effect. It's not two, three, or four drinks. And you can still drive home and such, although you're intoxicated, the same way you would be with ethanol. However, blindness ensues. Before that, you get the nausea, you get the headache, and then the blindness comes about, and then death comes about soon after that. So with anybody, and I have always loved the AEIOUs, and I'll make that a separate lecture all in itself. As a matter of fact, I'll make it the next lecture. AEIOU stands for a lot of good things. And the A for the altered mental status includes apoplexia, which is stroke alcohol and you have to think of any of the uh, butanols to ethanols to isopropyl alcohols down the methanol you have to think about all the alcohols here it's not just alcohol intoxication i was at a bar and i got stoned kind of thing it could be almost anything 
And we have a lot of morons that are out there today that show up at parties and like to drop little things in the drinks and such uh, to get other people either in a more compromising situation or as a great assassination uh, tool. Uh, anything can happen at any party, at any time, any place, anywhere. So the next morning when a person wakes up altered, well, he was out drinking all night with some friends. Uh, okay, well, if you're in downtown Los Angeles, a sophisticated place, it's probably a pretty good bet at Seth and all or one of the date rate drops. If you're in the Tennessee or Kentucky Hills, and you're getting your moonshine through radiators and such, then you have to be thinking about ethylene glycol or some of the antifreeze poisonings, poisonings which are alcohol related, or even methanol, wood poisoning. Uh, these, these will cause 12 to 18 hours later, cause all your symptoms, including blindness. So be worried. Altered mental status is one of them. Altered mental status can be a symptom found in just about everything in life. So what do you do with methanol? Let's say you got the skull and crossbone on a wood uh, barrel and the patient who is an alcoholic has been desperate to drink something. He's out of regular ethanol. So he sees wood alcohol on the side of a barrel and decides, oh, the barrel's wood. The alcohol's in there. It must be wood alcohol. Safe to drink. He drinks it. And the next thing you know, he's blind or he's altered. How do I treat it? First things first, 100% oxygen, non-rebreather, 15 liters. Second, start a line. 0.9 normal saline, give them a fluid bolus. Third, this is important, you may want to give bicarb right away. These type of poisons, especially wood alcohol poisons, if it's a known wood alcohol poisoning, can cause acidosis pretty quick in the bloodstream. Even though bicarbonate has been poo food as a resuscitation drug in cardiac arrest, carbon, I'm sorry, sodium bicarbonate still has its uses, which is why you still see sodium bicarbonate on competent protocols by board certified emergency medicine physicians being used in other situations than cardiac arrest. Methyl alcohol poisoning, ethanol poisonings are such an example. Tricyclic antidepressant overdoses are a perfect example. And of course, anybody who's been down for quite a while in a shock state will benefit from some bicarb as you try to restart their heart. So there's still some indications for carbon sodium bicarbonate. This is one of them in methyl alcohol. By raising the pH, you bind a lot of the free acid that's in there produced by the wood alcohol and you could avert disaster. Okay, the last substance we're going to cover real quick before I summarize this whole thing is ethylene glycol. This is odorless and colorless, although it does have a nice sweet taste to it. It's antifreeze. And the reason why pets die from it is because you spill this green little fluid on the floor of your garage. You don't clean it up. Cat or dog comes out, sees that it's green, smells it, smells sweet, tastes it, it tastes sweet, and they lap it up. And then a couple hours later, they're dead. It's the same thing with children. Children see it as a nice, pretty green liquid or a blue liquid, and it tastes sweet. And so they're going to be more prone to taking a larger dose of it because it tastes pretty good. And then within a short period of time, the child dies. And accidental overdoses and poisonings are still one of the top three causes of death in children. Now, what, how does it uh, poison you? It shuts down your liver, it shuts down your kidneys. And so you get uh, you know, a whole series of symptoms and such like that that you would get with anything else. So when somebody says, well, they look like they're intoxicated and they have altered mental status, nausea, vomiting, seizures, and coma, well, that can fit to just about any toxidrome that's out there. So you're not going to get a test on the National Registry that says, okay, which of the following poisons can cause CNS depression with an intoxicated appearance and nausea, vomiting, seizures, and coma? Because you can circle all of them and keep moving. Uh, you're not going to get a question like that. Uh, you have to have a high index of suspicion, and this is where these words make a lot of sense. If you're looking for it, you can find it. If you're looking for it and don't find it, it isn't there. But more times than not, if you're not thinking about it, or if you're not looking for it, 
you may not see it even if it is present. You have to have what they call a high index of suspicion. In other words, I think this might be going on. I'm in a garage, there's antifreeze laying all over the floor and I got an alter patient here, the car is not running. I got my carbon monoxide detector here and nothing's going on here. My eyes and ears and nose and throat aren't burning. Open up, ventilate, get them outside. Be thinking ethylene glycol. Now, again, this is a poison. So even in small doses, it can kill a patient. There's no such thing as an overdose on antifreeze because there's no normal dose. So you can't overdose on something that doesn't even have a normal dose. So bottom line is that ethylene glycol is testable on your exam. It has showed up on the last five exams that I could see. And it's a very, very common cause of childhood poisonings or pet poisonings. You go into a, a garage, you see a child lying there unresponsive and the cat or the dog are laying next to them and they're unresponsive. So one of the first things you'll be looking for is ethylene glycol. So you can, um, you can use something called calcium gluconate. Now most of you in your EMS boxes are carrying calcium chloride. It's an easy way to just open up the box, pop the yellow cap, screw it together, you get one gram of calcium chloride and you reverse whatever you've got going there right now. Calcium gluconate, on the other hand, isn't carried by very many systems. When I get them in the emergency room, I have to actually order calcium gluconate from the pharmacy to try and reverse the effects of the ethylene glycol. But the bottom line is it's just going to take a lot of fluids. It's going to take a lot of Lasix. So I'm setting up a constant flushing of the bloodstream and hopefully can wash out ethylene glycol. The beauty of it, it's water soluble. So when I wash it out, it'll wash out pretty quick. If it was fat soluble, like a fat soluble poison, you get into the tissues, it may take two, three, four days to get it out. Well, hell, by that time, the patient could very well be dead. Water soluble, it bathes the cells, but doesn't invade the cells very easily. So I can wash that out pretty quickly. But if you got calcium gluconate, that may be a uh, uh, substance that uh, you may get a peculiar order from medical online control. It says, look, if you're really thinking about this, then we really need to give calcium gluconate. So, all right, I think we're coming up on the bewitching hour. I thank you for the hour and the time here. If you have any questions, uh, since we covered a lot of material here, and I wanted to cover the material of the substances that I know that are gonna be on the next couple of exams. I wanna make sure you got the word association correct. More importantly, I want you to know that there's common allergy commonality with all the signs and symptoms here, especially altered mental status. And therefore, that's not going to be a big help. You're not going to see much there. But be word associating with these uh, particular substances, or at least be familiar with the situation that they may be in, such as the ethylene glycol example of having antifreeze on a garage floor. Uh, be Have a high index of suspicion for these folks. Now, my email address is jeframe at comcast.net. You can forward any question to me directly, and I will answer the question for you. When it comes to toxidromes, I don't mind the questions. It's very near and dear to my heart, but it also is tested on the National Registry, and I want to make sure that you're very clear about mostly safety precautions and situational awareness more than anything else. So before we depart, does anybody have any last questions for me? Jonathan, I'm glad you didn't get called away this time. John, thank you. Sarah, thank you. And Brenda, of course, your, your words are always kind. Juan, thank you. All right. If there's nothing else, uh, I'll close this recording out. And uh, Jane, it is on the cloud. And uh, 